Hello and welcome to another AIAS Thrive webinar. AISC is presenting a lecture by architect, fabricator, and sculptor Stan Carroll about computational methods. I'll review more about that shortly, but I'd like to make architecture students aware of some opportunities through AISC. First, briefly, who we are. We're a nonpartisan, non for profit technical institute and trade association for just over 100 years, and we do a lot behind the scenes for innovation and safety through research, education, developing codes, and um, overseeing certifications. We also do quite a lot for students. Um, what you may be most familiar with that we've been doing since 2000 is uh, the Steel Student Design um, Competition. This is, these are last year's winners, and we have two first place winners, which is unusual, in the monument category, and then one first place winner in the open category. You can do this as part of a studio, you can do this individually, you just need a faculty sponsor. Um, this year's project is a spiritual space on a campus of your choice, a little bit smaller project. So you could go to ACSA, read about that program, or as always, we have the open category program. We have a lot of scholarships for students. Last year, we gave over $360,000. They're open now until May. We would love for more architecture students to apply. Your chances are very good. There is a short essay, and you should focus on your um, connection with steel and design. And it could be through studio, a course, an internship, um, and a recommender might know um, of your experience with that. We offer students free membership and you get lots of perks. And one is the Modern Steel Construction Magazine, where you can read about things like our Forge Prize winners and finalists with really innovative design proposals. We have a partnership with AIAS and we offer AIA credits for this webinar, but we also do more hands-on types of experiences like through the iron workers facilities. Um, if your chapter or school would like to visit a fabrication shop or construction site, we can help facilitate that. If you can't physically go, uh, we have virtual reality tours on our website of both the fabrication shops and of um, construction tours. U.S. structural steel is truly cradle to cradle. That loop is closed. So domestic steel is made with 93 to 98% recycled steel. So we take old cars, appliances, deconstructed buildings and bridges out of the landfill. That scrap is melted down and um, th through electricity and then made into new structure. So truly from landfill to landmark. So using US structural steel framing is a very resilient, very sustainable option. We, um, in our last AIAS Thrive webinar, um, you can view on the AIAS YouTube channel a uh, presentation about sustainable hybrid steel framing and wood floor design. I mentioned AIA credit. It's best to just go to the website AISC.org backslash AIAS and write down this quiz code AIAS021 for this particular webinar. Um, you should be able to follow the directions there, but here's a couple of screenshots of what you might see and where you enter that information. If you have questions, you can email me at homer at AISC.org. And back to our presentation. Stan Carroll is a practicing architect in Oklahoma City, and he does all these things. I also included educator because that's how I know him. He has done lots of different things over time, and he's going to share these with you and walk through his journey with you, and he'll focus on computational design and steel fabrication. He'll begin with some foundational ideas about computational design, and then he'll take you through some of his projects, ending in his competition winning project, the Doris Miller Memorial. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, thanks, Jean. Um, I'm really, really tickled to be here to talk to you guys and, and walk you through some of my work. Um, hopefully there'll be some Fresh information that uh, some of you all may not have may not have run across yet, uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, the primary things are how observation is a key part of the design process. It begins at, at astute observation, uh, the ability to notice and understand uh, conditions of a project so that uh, it, it fosters uh, a beautiful kind of result in the end, which then is is uh, 
offered through uh, computational methods uh, that involve simulation um, to develop a deeper understanding of a problem. And uh, so observation to com computational curiosity, simulation to understanding is the piece. And then I wanted to start with a project just to show you, just a, an idea to kind of help everybody understand where I'm coming from regarding computational methods and how I use uh, computational methods to, uh, to develop instruments, uh, which is more than a tool. So I wanted to talk about how information uh, that you develop in your computational tools uh, informs your design process in a way that really was are kind of new to more 21st century design processes. Um, I'm a student of the 80s uh, is when I went to architecture school. And the process that I use is very different than what we used in the 80s. Um, I adopted computational design, uh, started using it really as my full-time way of working through design problems uh, back in 2009. And so I've been pretty much during that time transitioned all the way to computational design. And so you'll see kind of a reversal of the process where normally in the old kind of 80s intuitive design, I call it, um, it's more top down where you come up with an idea and then you go try to figure out how to build it. And uh, But this computational uh, approach is more of a bottom up system where we where we establish um, the way materials and structure all interact very um, integrally uh, to to inform uh, a design solution, and so your design solution is really a result of kind of the that internal workings of the process. So um, so we have performative systems through computational instruments, and this first idea is how to uh, create a simulation to develop analysis to understand a problem deeper. And uh, and then in some later projects, we're going to talk about the validation through prototyping and how we really inform uh, the master builder of, of um, developing very intimate knowledge with the way construction processes happen. It's uh, building things is very much a part of the foundational information that I build my process, my practice on. Um, so I've been a fabricator for years and was first an architect designer. And then I started fabricating because I just, I just felt like fabrication was so critical to the mission that uh, without that, you know, innate, fabrication knowledge, you're really designing kind of in a, you know, in a little bit of a vacuum. Um, through experience, you develop better skills, but there's nothing like the knowledge that you gain is from being a fabricator. So, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll see this prototyping process that is well informed by that fabrication um, and yields a, a much richer final result. Um, Tools merely extend our capability to do something in physical terms. On other instruments are embodied an embodiment of the mind and materialization of thought. Uh, this is a fascinating idea of the difference between tools and instruments. I never really thought about it, but this first little project, I wanted to dive off into that idea of how computational become, can become an instrument that informs you um, in a much higher level than just a tool to help you do something pragmatic. Um, regarding the eclipse that happened in 2017, I think I was there that day with Gene. As a matter of fact, I think Gene, you were with me because you came and got me when we uh, went to, we decided to go to the library because the entire campus, it was August, semester had just started. And um, everybody was kind of meeting at the, in front of the library, a very uh, community space there at OSU's campus, and um, to just kind of enjoy in the in the revelry of the eclipse. And it wasn't a full eclipse, but it was a you know eighty seven percent or something of that nature. And so we all just got in and uh, headed down there. And this is kind of your typical stippling of 
a sidewalk as the sun shines through a tree. Well, as we were walking through that event there in front of the library, very informal event, we noticed that there was effectively a camera obscura situation. I don't know if you all are familiar with camera obscura, but um, it's it's actually been around since like 400 BC. The Chinese discovered it uh, in uh, way back when. And um, so what you find is the stippling of a tree is the filtering of the sun. And so this is an image of, on the right-hand side of the image is, is a tree. And that's that sun is shining in that window through those blinds. And then on the opposite wall in that same room, is the image that's being cast upon the wall. And you'll see that on the left-hand side of the left image, um, there are just circles. It, these are not, you know, kind of the profile of a leaf, which you might expect, but it, this is true ca camera obscura, so that those are actually suns. Those are actually representations of the sun in a camera obscura. And so what we found out was during when we were walking to this eclipse event, we looked down and noticed the trees as they were, as the stippling of the sun during the eclipse, uh, we noticed that every single one of these, these um, little images were in fact a replication or a camera obscura of this partial eclipse, which you can see in these moon shaped um, uh, images. And so it, it, piqued my curiosity and a big part of my curiosity, I immediately go to computational uh, tools to try to figure out and explain why this happens. Well, it was fascinating for one, but we were there for about 30 minutes. And uh, when we came back through, the interesting thing was, was when we came back through the, the, the uh, direction of the crescent sun a camera obscura image that was on the sidewalk outside had completely reversed. So it was almost 180 degrees from the first image. So it was like that blew my mind. It's only been 30 minutes. How can this giant solar, you know, uh, solar scale on a solar scale, how could that have possibly rotated 180 degrees in 30 minutes? And so I immediately set out to, to explore you know, and try to explain how that happens and try to understand in a deeper level how that worked. So I developed this computational simulation, which is a big part of what we do um, in, in my design, kind of my design methods, uh, is to develop sim uh, <clears throat> simulations to, to help understand things. And so let me run this little simulation and you can see that that is the crescent moon and you can see the moon is, or this, the Earth shadow is just moving at a consistent speed across the, the sun. And, um, and so the crescent, the resulting crescent moon, you can see in the diagram at the left, uh, where we've uh, basically created a, a little graph of the rotational language and the rotational velocity, um, the, the, uh, about 80% of the rotate of that full rotation, it was almost 180 degrees, not quite, but that full rotation happened in about 30 minutes. It was a three hour event. You can see it went from about 1130 in the morning to 230 in the afternoon. But in that middle 30 minutes is, which is about the time we went over there, we were there for only about 30 minutes. And during that time, you had a complete reversal. Um, and so it was fascinating to see, see how that works. So the idea is that these computational methods give you the ability to precisely simulate things. And through those simulations, you develop a deeper understanding. Uh, I won't belabor that too much, but let me just kind of move on. And just to remind you that uh, every time you see stippling on a sidewalk, think of it, those are camera obscuras. They aren't, they aren't leaf uh, profiles. Those are camera obscuras. So um, kind of a, a unique understanding there. So anyway, that's an, a good idea of, uh, how this works. Another idea I want to share with you is bottom-up design. Uh, Top-down design is more of an 80s intuitive process where you think, okay, I, I want this, uh, this object or this building or whatever, and, and you develop an idea and you know, then go design and then say, okay, this is the design we want. Now you start backing into how, how do we structure this thing? How do we put mechanical in it? How do we do all the stuff to get that final result? 
Well, bottom-up design is exactly opposite, where you develop relationships and 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 understanding, and then you let those relationships kind of unveil a uh, solution later in the process. So it's really a reversal. And so I included this little project. I don't know if you all are familiar with the digital futures. Um, it's a fantastic, you should follow it if you're into computational methods. You should check out digitalfutures.world, I believe. Um, and it is, uh, I started a PhD right before COVID hit. And um, uh, then it killed, it was in China, it was in Shanghai, and it killed the uh, program for me because um, I couldn't travel to China anymore. And um, so anyway, the digital, it was a digital futures program. Um, anyway, check it out if you want. Anyway, this is their logo, and it was just a good example. I designed a logo for this, but I did not set out to define a logo or to design a logo. We were really trying to solve a problem, and then I was using computational methods to solve the problem. The problem was this is a worldwide, uh, the Digital Futures is a worldwide conference that they do completely virtually, very high quality uh, computational methods. Um, and so they were, we were trying to organize and, and uh, coordinate how we're going to do these programs where we have simultaneous people in uh, lectures or presentations. And um, how are we going to organize? You know, we have people on all sides of the world. So I started first. This is the logo that began that ended up. This is where it ended up. But I, I wanted to kind of then show you a little bit of how we got there. And it's more of a bottom up process. So first I started plotting all the different time zones. You can see each concentric circle is a time zone. And we were selective. We didn't do all 24 time zones. We kind of picked the ones because, you know, through the Pacific, there's not many people there. So we didn't represent those. So you can see many different time zones there. You've got Sydney, Tokyo, Shanghai, Bangkok, uh, Mumbai. You, know, you can just go through the list there. And um, and so then we we were looking at how do we coordinate all those? These are kind of the the only things we're plotting here are the waking hours or what's typically the waking hours in those time zones. So it started to show when people would normally be available and you can start to see any any um, a radial line would be uh, happening at the same moment across the different time zones. So there was just kind of this graphic representation of how these different time zones related. And, and then you can see how that then translated just kind of that data that was um, you know, just driven by just the pragmatics of how are we going to coordinate these people? It was a, quite a beautiful diagram in the end. And so we you know, tweaked it a little bit more just to kind of create something more that looked more like a logo and less like a you know, uh, scheduling diagram or something. So um, that was the end up uh, being the final logo. So anyway, that was just kind of an example of this bottom up uh, design process where, where um, where we established kind of this integral relationship first, and then that translated into a final solution. So those are a couple of ideas that you'll see throughout this presentation that I wanted to present to you just to kind of get you thinking about um, computational design, bottom-up bottom up design work. Okay, um, my career started out, you know, way before computational methods happened. So uh, I had a real fascination with fabrication. And so I've just included some uh, work here just to give you a context of, of where my practice has been and where it began early on. I was, I was really just a commercial architect working for your typical firm or whatever um, for you know 10 years or so before I really started diving off and really enjoying designing furniture and things. And so um, really just wanted to show you some of that work and you'll see um, you'll see it evolve through the process. This was the original piece. I won't go into too, a lot of detail on all of these because I want to kind of get to the meat of the projects a little later, but I did want to show you a little context. Um, so um, first piece I did, all I had was a screwdriver, a drill, and some tin snips. That's all I had. So I was really constrained by just the materials I had. 
So these first few couple of pieces are just a result of that. You know, then I had to come up with interesting ways to join two pieces of metal. I had no tools to kind of create any kind of uh, overlap or seaming or anything. I just had to kind of figure out how to do it. So I just, uh, you know, started use, letting those details drive the thing. So somewhat of, an, of a bottom-up process, you know, where the details start to inform what the what the final design is, but in the end, it was really a top down, it kind of coming from both directions, top down and bottom up, and they somehow meet in the middle. I also had some some uh, clients that wanted a set of chairs, say, and they had super conservative, super conservative uh, tastes, and they didn't want me to go off and do wacky stuff. So they just said, no, no, we're more conservative. Can you do anything, you know, that we can both like? And so this was a, 100% stainless steel steel ladder back chair. So it kind of satisfied their needs to be somewhat conservative and my needs to kind of explore new material connections. Uh, this is a, a table. I went through a peristyle leg uh, period where um, this is the telephone table that set, it set at the Hertz Corporation uh, outside one of their conference rooms. People could go and take a phone call. There's an integral light fixture. The little reflector up there is actually a reflector. It's not the light source. The light source is in the table. So that light source goes up, strikes the reflector, and then reflects back down to you know light your notes or whatever. Um, a center, center hinge dresser where every drawer just rotates around that center hinge. I'll just kind of click through these more quickly. Um, some tables, this table, um, 232 legs, I think, is on this table. It had this, it was an architect's office. Um, here's another table that has no legs. Um, well, the legs are really, I mean, technically they're outboard there, out and defining the space as well on high tension rods. Um, a crazy um, tricycle that's huge, adult, adult size tri tricycle. And I wanted to be able to uh, stand on the back and hold the driver's shoulders like we used to do when we were little. So it's just kind of this scaled up kid's tricycle. And then a client asked me to create a bench that, that represented each of the family members. And so here are the butt prints on this kind of edgy bench. Um, and it, it, I, I used them, I had them in a sitting and uh, took a, a profile of the family. And then, so these, these are some more uh, chairs. I was just exploring what I can do with a piece of a long strip of sheet metal and how crazy can I get with, with having fun with that, a couple of different versions. Then there, then I started, this is about the time I really started getting deeper into Rhino and started playing with uh, Boolean differences. This is a cube minus a cylinder. That arm looks like it's a subjective decision, but it's actually where the cylinder extends beyond the cube. So that cylinder is kind of cocked up and to the side at some obscure little, you know, seven degree angle or some crazy angle that basically generated those geometries. So they're very much kind of playful geometry. And then this is a what I call the lollipop stool. Um, and I ch explored a chase lounge. And then um, in 2000. 13, I guess, it was on the cover of Vogue Italia magazine, um, which was very exciting to be on the cover of a magazine. Uh, and uh, this is a conference room that I, uh, the client gave me, he said, Stan, I have, I want you to do a conference room for me. I just demoed a building, but we saved all the glass and some of the beams, and I just want you to reuse all my materials. So it was this highly constrained project that, um, that uh, all the glass was tempered. So if you know anything about glass, you can't cut or change tempered glass size or it'll shatter into a hundred million pieces. So I had to take these glass and then figure out a way to kind of constrain them and hold them up. And so it was the result of this, uh, the glass on the left in this image is, is the glass was too tall to go vertical. So I just rotated it horizontal. It happened to be about the right length. And then I overlapped it vertically and you know built established this kind of integral uh, structural system that just kind of held this glass in place to create that. Um, another, uh, this is the same family that had the little butt bench. Um, this is a gate outside. Um, 
So this was polished stainless steel. There's a construction company that asked me to do a piece outside of theirs. Uh, this is just kind of an abstract version of the of the piece. You can't really tell what's going on, but whenever you walk around to this specific position, uh, there's a what I call the sweet spot, and their their logo appears within the plates. Uh, kind of a perspective game I had fun with. Um, picking that sweet spot was a lot of fun. Uh, then this is a, a major project I did in about 2012 or so. Um, again, it's just Rhino. No All the work you've seen up to date has no computational methods. Uh, these are all just kind of subjective, top-down um, projects. And pretty photogenic pro project. The little cutouts where the cables connect are all relating directly to the angle of the cable as they as it strikes the mast. Um, so everything's kind of driven uh, by geometric relationships, as a lot of my work is. I'll click through these more quickly. And then wanted to kind of now talk about some more top-down versus bottom-up versions. Um, we started, I, this is about the time I started to develop computational methods. And early on, my my use of computation was really an established based upon, wow, what is this cool thing? It was really a way to manage complexity. So this is one of the first pieces I did uh, with that. And it was really, um, it's just these, sil these are, it's basically wind generation. And these are the circles that represent uh, the amount of area when you're calculating wind, wind energy in Oklahoma, there's a lot of wind turbines. And this was right outside of the uh, department there, at Oklahoma State University Technical Institute. And that was where they did their uh, wind turbine work. And so this was really representing that. And then this was uh, for, at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Uh, they had wind turbines on the top of their building. They're helical shaped, and um, so this is called Oklahoma Wind. It's a computationally driven geometry that you can maybe see a bird wing. Uh, you can see the helix of the DNA helix, and then you can also see an abstraction of, of the old style uh, air motor windmills uh, from the you know early early 20th century late 18th or 19th and early 20th century. So this piece was called Oklahoma Wind. It was really just a representation of how the wind is informing. And um, so it, these, these ideas, early on, I used computational methods to manage complexity. So it allowed me to take on these more complex forms and be able to manage them practically. It's pretty hard to do very complex forms just manually. It just, you seem to draw for hours and hours and hours. But if you can manage them computationally, so that's kind of level one on, you know, level one on the computational game is how to manage complexity. Uh, some of the works I've just showed you were that. And then also this Skydance Bridge, which is one of my major pieces was also where I was really just using computation to manage complexity. Um, this was, it was a design competition. Uh, we ended up winning the design competition. This was our competition winner. It was a $16 million bridge, uh, pedestrian bridge. And then uh, the 2008 um, crisis, uh, economic crisis hit and the city came, the city of Oklahoma City came back to us and said, Stan, we can't, there's no way we can look the public in the eye and build a $16 million pedestrian bridge. We need you guys to reduce the cost of this thing down to 5.8 million. And we kind of went, oh my gosh, that that is kind of unheard of. You, you can always cut 20% out of a project, but to cut 60% out of a project is almost unheard of without you know major impact on the project. So we just set forward to basically use and be as smart as we could about how do we apply materials. So we went from this solid plate structure that you see here, which would have been fabulous, don't get me wrong, but um, we couldn't afford it anymore because they changed the project. They, uh, they were kind enough to pay us to design it again because they knew they had, you know, it was kind of out of everybody's hands that the economic downturn hit. So uh, we got to design the project twice, which wasn't so bad. Um, 
And so this is the computational uh, grasshopper definition. I knew that this was going to be about uh, computation. So I said, well, I've got to at least show one definition. So this is the definition for how we did, how we solved the problem. This is the final scheme. And I'll go into more detail about it. But you can see that no longer is it solid plates, but we were able to maintain the, the height and uh, most everything except for the solidness. And uh, so that's where we were trying to do is how to be efficient materi with material. And so we developed um, this, this bridge is based upon or it's inspired by the Oklahoma uh, bird, which is the scissor tail flycatcher. Um, and it's not a literal expression of it, but it's forms that somehow reference it, as well as the flight patterns and a lot of different things. So then, and then on the outside, these panelized systems that ba basically allowed us to add visual weight to this, the spires, um, or what we call the wings, uh, we call those feathers, uh, because it was emulating a bird in some sense, in an abstracted way. And, and so then I've got several pictures here, and we'll go, get into more detail about uh, how we use computation here in a little bit. But here's some construction photos of when they're building the tail. It's giant, you can see the people. To give you a little scale, they're not, they're pretty small back there. This is a huge piece. It's 200 feet tall and 150, or the bridge itself is 400 feet long. This, these are just the feet, the, the pieces that land in the middle of the highway. Um, you know, big four inch thick steel plate, uh, enormous, enormous pieces of structure. Um, and this is it kind of right before transportation. This system here is how we develop this feather system. These feathers, there's 672, I believe, uh, feathers with over 10,000 bolts that hold all these feathers in place. Each of these feathers is unique. Every, all 700 and 672, whatever the number is, um, is each one is unique. They, they, they decrease in size as the spire, you know, decreases in width as you go up. Um, all the whole configurations are different. Um, and it was all managed through that grasshopper definition that I showed you earlier. That was the definition that managed all these. The thing that no one ever notices is the girts, which are these elements here. And those girts are what are actually supporting those, those um, feathers. And those, each, each of those girts is absolutely unique because the feathers are twisting as they go up the spire. So um, uh, each one of those is slightly different. Every row is slightly different. So um, developing a computational methodology that, that helps define those so that we could really control those feathers with more broad stroke controls like lines and or surfaces that define those. And then the definition then generates these cut files that go straight to the laser cutter. So it, it's a fairly sophisticated uh, definition that's you know taking each one of those feathers and you know driving the girt profiles as well as the feather sizes and all the bolt holes. Interesting tidbit of information. After this project was done, uh, the ten thousand bolts, um, the fabricator and us and erectors came to us. And after it was all over, they said, Stan, guess what? There were 10,000 bolts. There wasn't a single bolt out of place. They didn't have to waller or, you know, finagle a bolt anywhere to have to make it fit, which is kind of mind-numbingly amazing. But it, not as great a testament to my, my skills, but it, it is a testament to computational methods that if you if you develop beautiful kind of instructions to give the computer, that's kind of the feathers. Here's some more pictures. There I am on the left, um, examining their work as along the way, and you can kind of see the complexity and understand uh, that none of those are repetitive. It's all completely customized. There's a I love showing this picture of them actually driving to. It was only fabricated about three miles away. It just so happens we have a really world-class fabricator called WW Steel in Oklahoma City. And it just so happens uh, that they were able to fabricate it for us. And um, so this is them moving it. And so you can see the scale of this tail, which is only just the tail. Um, and it was interesting there, there were about two turns that they had to make from their shop to the site. 
And they had to they had to station big cranes at each of those corners so that whenever the truck got to that corner, they grabbed on to the back of this piece of structure and just grabbed on with a strap, lifted it up and swung that lift the wheels of the trailer off the ground and swung it around to to get it to make the corner because there was no way to make a corner with a you know 150 foot long trailer. So anyway, pretty fascinating kind of logistics. They're they're quite brilliant uh, fabricators. So anyway, love working with them when I get a chance. Um, so th- here's some. This is the hero shot, the kind of final shot looking toward downtown. Um, really distinctive details. Um, and I'll just kind of click through these. It's pretty photogenic, also. Um, just a lot of, you know, you can kind of take all day and. If you're a photographer, it's just a lot of fun to shoot. It has a lot, you know, some fabulous lighting at night. So night, there's a million other opportunities. Here was one storm, one Oklahoma storm, which is kind of mind blowing that 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 someone captured this image. Uh, pretty mind blowing. And then I'm most proud that only in a, about a month ago, they announced that they were issuing four new U.S. Uh, forever stamps. And the Skydance Bridge right here is being represented um, represented on it. So that was super, super fun. Um, so now um, we're going to launch off into performance-based design. One of my favorite, uh, ins- my favorite, uh, highly admired uh, practitioners in this area is Akim Mengus, who, um, who is leading the... Uh, an entire research institute at Stuttgart in Germany. And he is at the forefront of this type of computational method fabrication. Um, if you are interested in this, look Akim Mingus and Stuttgart up. They're doing incredible work. Uh, so please track that. It's well worth it and unbelievable work. Um, but his, I wanted to read this quote, a design method requiring an understanding of form, material, and structure, not as separate elements, but rather as complex interrelations that are embedded in and explored through integral processes of computational metamorphogenesis. So that is at the core of what this performance-driven computational methods is. And that that is so well said. And um, that's what we aspire to do always. And so so um, it's you can tell that it's that is the definition of that bottom up where you're okay. So just know that. And then I did a, a master's degree. I'm a kind of a lifelong learner guy back at the age of 52. I'm 62 now, but at the age of 52, I went back to university to do a master's degree in this area of, of study that I was so passionate about. As soon as I became uh, versed in computational methods, I knew that I could not, I wasn't tapping all the benefits from computational design. And I said, man, uh, a colleague said, Stan, you just need to take a year and go do a master's at, at the Architectural Association. So that's what I did, uh, which seemed crazy. I had wife and five kids and, um, and seemed crazy to just leave and go do that. But it turned out to be the best decision I ever made as far as uh, advancing my career. So because what it did, it, it, it allowed me to learn this method, which is not a simple, straightforward method. It's fairly complex, and it's it's such a divergent diversion from the old 80s top-down method of, of design uh, that it, you really have to immerse yourself in the philosophy. And I had no one in Oklahoma uh, that was doing any of this work even remotely close to this work. So I knew that I had to get to where the other people were. So that I took a year and did that. This is our thesis project. I just wanted to kind of give you another example of of this analytical simulation uh, process, uh, bottom up simulation process, analytic, highly analytical. Um, our early work was creating a a um, a mold for concrete fabrication, um, a, a a mold that could be reconfigured and to develop any kind of double curvature form. And so it was this series of of rods and then a membrane on top of the rods that span between the rods. And then you can pour the concrete on it and you can kind of see how uh, 
these can shift and change as we need to. And we started analyzing the kind of curvatures we could achieve and the limitations of it and everything. And um, how do we actually support and how, how do we actually fabricate it? Well, we finally built this prototype um, and you can see the rods and then in, inside there's a silicon membrane that uh, inside that membrane is uh, carbon fiber uh, paraboloids that, that span between these planes to help smooth these membranes out. So there was quite a, it turns out that that membrane was really where the core of the work happened. I, we were surprised to find that that was really where the challenges were. Then this is a, a chase lounge that we explored doing and really just designed, analyzed all the situations. Um, this is some of the analysis that we do through computational methods to, we do a lot of uh, finite element analysis processes because those are highly relational to, they allow predictability in material performance. And so um, these are some of those analysis um, that we did along the way to help, you know, manage the curvature and keep curvature smooth and those kind of things. So then we had to formulate a way that we could use this, this three, this three dimensional form work. And, uh, we established the goal of saying, let's, let's find a way that we can de develop acoustic, an acoustical experience. And these are the, these on the upper left-hand corner of this image is these listening devices that they built in World War, prior to World War II or right during World War II, where they could listen in the UK, they could listen for the Nazis coming across the English Channel. So they built these listening devices and their paraboloid, I'm sorry, um, ellipsoids in their formal mathematical geometry, their ellipsoids and those ellipsoids uh, focus the sound and give you the ability, it's, it's like, you know, doing like this with your ears only in a very sophisticated way. And so they had the ability to uh, listen for the Nazis. And so they had, you know, a couple of hours of, or I don't know, maybe not a couple of hours, but at least an hour of, of time that they could hear them before they'd actually get there. So they had a little forewarning that they were on their way. Uh, then the guy on the right is just kind of another example of such a, such a device. And then the guy at the bottom is a, kind of a, another project that we did not do, but it's just another example of using these ellipsoids to gather sound. So that was our charge. We took that on and we were going to list, we were going to place these ellipsoids around a park and then focus each of those ellipsoids on a particular place, like focus it on the tree and listen to the birds chirping in the tree and focus it on a, a table at a, at a pub beside the park and be able to kind of focus in on listening to the conversation of the park or uh, listening to the conversation at the pub table. And then we also focused one on um, a park bench where you can maybe hear two, two people having a conversation on the park bench. Sorry, that's a little creepy. But uh, anyway, it was all kind of fictitious anyway. We didn't actually build it, but it was capable of doing. We focused others to... Uh, like um, a church bell that was, you know, six blocks away. So that, so we just kind of picked little things that we could focus them on so that it could be this experience. And then um, using different geometry, we knew that we could either focus, you can see on these, that if this is the sound source and this is a segmented thing, you could focus the sound here, but it didn't focus it very well. But if you use a smooth elliptical surface, it does focus it really well. So all the sound that is embodied in these rays would happen right here. So if you'd stand right there, you could hear it completely. Or if it was flipped the other way, it would completely disperse the sound. So there's this very kind of highly acoustic process that, um, that we were considering. It turns out the way an ellipsoid works is it just so happens that every, if the source, if you're at this source and you're listening, you've got a source there and the listener here, that every sound wave that leaves this source will arrive at that point. It might be slightly different because the distances are slightly different, but but it's pretty close and they all arrive there. So it's like the whispering, um, the whispering vaults uh, in Europe. You may have heard of those. Um, that vault isn't quite the right word. I'm, I'm forgetting what it is at this moment, but 
whispering chambers or something. Anyway, they have existing structures that you can just whisper on this side and, you know, 35, 40 feet away, somebody can hear you on the other side. Well, it's this idea. So we we set out to do this ourselves. So, so it's all kind of developing computational methods to decide how this structure can work. It so happens that concentric ellipsoids are a, are a common family. So each of these ellipsoids, this large one and the medium one and the small one, each of those ellipsoids, they all share their, their source and uh, listener foci position. So it doesn't matter which ellipsoid you land in as long as they're from the same ellipsoidal family so that they share these foci. And um, so that gave us latitude to start to differentiate uh, how we how we would you know develop forms. So we we wrote an algorithm that that generates these sorry these uh, things and these schemes. These are all you know ten schemes that we did in a, a, a genetic algorithm that we uh, developed. And we can measure the fitness qualities. And these are the fitnesses you can see they're written there, the maximum sound intensity. So we were trying to find the, the version that had the maximum sound intensity. We wanted to minimize the sound intensities in an anechoic zone. In other words, we wanted the zones between them to reduce, reduce and be the quietest places. And then we also wanted to minimize the total surface area of each of the sections. So that physically, we knew if we made them really large, you know, you obviously can catch more sound, but there's also an economy of material. If we could increase the, the sound intensity and decrease the area of the, of the uh, material that was required to generate it, uh, we would, you know, gain economically. And then we also wanted to minimize the structural displacement. So if it was something very strangely structured, uh, it would have deflection, and that would, you know, break down the ellipsoidal geometry. So we were trying to uh, perform, create all those performances. And genetic algorithms are a powerful beast, uh, especially when you're starting to com have conflicting uh, performance criteria, fitness criteria, which is what we were doing here. So anyway, won't dwell too much on that, but it's a fascinating area of study if you're interested. Track it. Uh, so this is our this was our final form. This was the one that we found performed the best. Each color represents a different system of each each different like uh, at the ends of these lines that, that go off the page. Um, that is where the source of sound is. The little white spheres are the listening position. So there's a listening position. There's a listening position. Each of ends of those lines are listening positions. And so each color represents a single ellipsoidal system. And um, so then the idea is you would walk from this listening position to this listening position, and you'd, be, you'd get to listen to whatever that system was focused on, which is off the page. So that's the basic idea of how this worked. And we use computational methods to establish um, you know, how, to, how to actually do that. And then we also broke these into panelized systems uh, that that then informed our our pin mold, our um, our mold that we made, so that we could, in theory, then form each of these each of these shells as required. And they're very com complex geometry. So that's kind of that was the uh, master's thesis, and then. Um, Sorry, this is the uh, Doris Miller Memorial, which is, uh, this is the only project I've done since, well, the only large project I've done since I graduated with my master's. And hopefully you'll see a much higher level of incorporation of this morphogenic process that Kim Mingus summarized in his comment. Um, and so this is, um, super proud of this work. I was super proud of the Skydance Bridge as well, especially it's here where I live. Uh, but this is in Waco, Texas. And so anyway, if you're down in Waco, check it out. I'm quite proud of it. It's probably my my favorite project that I've done so far. So anyway, let's let's get into it. It was a World War II hero that was serving on the USS West Virginia that was parked in Pearl Harbor during the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, his name was Doris Miller. Uh, he was also the guy that was represented by 
um, uh, what's this actor's name? Kubid, uh, Kubid Jr. Anyway, sorry, his name escapes me at this moment. You probably know, but this is the Pearl Harbor movie, the main, you know, blockbuster movie. Um, and this was him too. And so he was portraying Doris Miller. This is Doris actually getting his medal. And so anyway, that's the background. This is the final piece. And I'll, I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of the project before we start getting diving into the details of it. Um, this project was also a very large project. It's 140 feet long, 17 feet tall at the bow. It's basically half of a half of a ship or it is an abstraction of a ship. Um, to have this naval rever reference uh, for Doris Miller. This is the uh, life and a half size. So this figure is nine feet tall. So that gives you some kind of scale. A, a normal person is only about, goes up to about his elbows. Um, and so you can tell this is a quite tall. This is 17 feet at the bow. Um, it is a, it's comprised of purely, um, one tenth of an inch thick sheet metal. Um, there is no internal structure. It is all completely the performance of the plate material that you see. There is no internal. Uh, it's the the way this structure is performing is completely within the performance of that sheet metal um, by uh, physical material geometry stiffness. Um, and it's one tenth of an inch thick. Again, this project had over 38,000 volts. It had 1,500 parts, each part unique. Um, they appear to be a module there that you can see. Um, again, at the end of at the end of this fabrication, uh, the fabricators again said, "Stan, every single bolt hole was correct. They never had to wall or a single bolt hole." Um, so 38,000 bolt holes. That's a Pretty good, uh, pretty good batting average. Anyway, um, uh, I'll kind of break down, kind of, well, let's talk about each module. You can see these modules, each each square I'm calling a module. Each, each one of these little squares, they get larger and larger as you get from one end to the other. And they each module is made of seven pieces. And you can see the three pieces. And there's about 38, I'm sorry, uh, 41 bolts to that hold each module together. So 41 bolts, and I can't remember how many modules there are there. There's a lot. Um, you can see the different parts there. And so um, in this scenario, um, I use performance-based finite element analysis to break down. Uh, I had a very... I wrote an algorithm that generates the geometry of the wall that you can see here in the black, and it's generalized. So it's um, into a finite element. Is, this is in RISA. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It, the engineers, I'm sure, are familiar with RISA, uh, finite element analysis software. And I could generate these um, um and analyze, analyze them and then, then determine the deflection up here at the bow, which is where it's a double cantilever up at the bow. And so basically it was fascinating that the geometry, I didn't have just a single model. I had the algorithm so I could change the geometry, you know, in just 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, I could have a whole completely new geometry testing it and translating it into the RISA software and then establishing uh, the deflection on a completely new scheme in about a 30 minute time frame. The whole process took about 30 minutes. So in a half a day, I went from my first scheme when I first uh, put in the first wall, um, the deflection, it was like you know 18 inches of deflection. So in a hundred mile an hour wind, which is what uh, we will require 110 miles an hour, I think, 110 mile an hour wind, uh, I was getting like 18 inch deflection, which is completely unacceptable. I was going to kill somebody with a, if, if the thing didn't self destruct having 18 inches in, in deflection. Cause I just try, I just tried something and 
And so just by manipulating that algorithm in 30 minutes, I could have another scheme and I'd knock it down to 16 inches or something. And so in a half a day, I went through about six or eight schemes and just by manipulating visually, you couldn't really see much difference between each scheme, but I could add rows, I could add modules, I could, uh, within the, the thickness of the wall, I could create more, more belly or more curvature in the wall. And this is double curvature in both directions. It's vertically curved as well as horizontally curved. Um, so I could manipulate all of those just kind of instantaneously. I basically controlled the entire wall by, by four lines, a, a line at the top, a line at the, at the ground, and a line in the middle, which gave me the belly. And then another line that basically was the, the uh, other side of the wall at the back. So the, the, between those four lines, I could completely manipulate uh, this new and find a new structure to test. And so by the end of the half a day of testing, I had the deflection down to one inch. And uh, so, just, and you literally could not see the difference. I mean, if you really compared them close, overlaid them or something, you probably could. But as far as just visually standing back, looking at it, um, you really couldn't perceive much difference. Um, so that was super fascinating. What's interesting is then I had to have a structure. I'm not a structural engineer, but uh, I had it. I hired a structural engineer to uh, analyze it for me just to be another set of eyes and actually be the guy that stamps the structural drawings. Um, and he, he analyzed it himself completely. He had to satisfy himself, but I had, took him that solution. So the solution was already kind of established. Um, and I took it to him and I said, well, I've, I've got it. What I think is down to one inch of deflection. You tell me what you think and tell me if you, you know, and then we started working on details and stuff. Um, but he said, Stan, I didn't quite get the same deflection as you did. I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm going, oh no, I'm back to the drawing board. But he said, nope, I got only a half an inch deflection. So I thought it was a one inch deflection. He, oh, he, calculated a half an inch when he calculated. He was able to take a much, um, uh, I had to be, I took more conservative approach. He he has the knowledge so he could, he didn't have to be as conservative as I did. So that's how he was able to get to a half an inch deflection. Um, so anyway, super fascinating to see that and to also see a process where you can, you can, uh, you can basically adjust the stiffness of the structure through pure algorithmic uh, manipulation. Okay, sorry, I kind of went on and on about that. Uh, these these images are not showing the full deflection in these softwares. Just so you know, uh, you can amplify it visually so that you can just physically see it as a human. If it was only moving a half an inch, you wouldn't be able to really even see it. But these are amplifications. So this is not this is not rep a good representation of the deflection. Okay, and then I also wanted to talk you through the, the uh, uh, prototyping process of how we got to this geometry. Kind of get, I kind of went through the structure first, but now I'm kind of going back to how we work through this prototyping process. And, and the thing that connects me as a fabricator to the design of this structure is, is the thing that's really the touch point that connects me to the design of the structure as a fabricator is the fact that I go through a full prototyping process, multi-step prototyping process. I, I would describe a, the prototyping process as you make a section and you represent it in a very simple way that's inexpensive to build and you can quickly create. And then you slowly scale that model up, 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 up and test it along the way. And each time you do a model, you learn more about it. So this first white model was was purely just paper. You know, I, I just build it out of, you know, kind of a cardstock grade paper. And, and it was about, you know, four feet tall, I don't know, 30 inches wide or so is this size. You know, it was about half scale um, for this little section. And it was really just confirming that we could in fact get the parts to fit together and it made sense in three dimensions and those kinds of things. You also got a sense of stiffness if it felt strong or if it felt like it was just floppy and just never going to, you know, even come close. It performed fairly well. It wasn't great. So we refined the next one. 
And so the, the prototyping process, not only are you scaling in size each iterative process, each iterative uh, prototype, but you're also scaling in material stiffness. So that's you're scaling stiffness at the same time as you're, you're scaling size so that you start to encounter uh, the challenges that you're going to encounter in the end. And you could just try to build this thing full scale, full material the first time, but it would be extremely expensive and you probably aren't going to get it right. So you're spending a bunch of money um, and you don't get the benefit of learning anything at a very economic rate. It takes a little time to build another version, but you end up learning a little bit more each time. And as you as you put two or three or four of these together, you get better and better and you, you learn things along the way and you modify it in the next one. So this next one was a sheet metal version. This, this, this was about a 24 gauge, which is 0.024, which is about a fourth of the thickness of the final steel. So it's still... Uh, the scale of the stiffness of the material is less. The size of the modules is still less than uh, the actual. Uh, so we we haven't scaled all that, but we did make a big leap in stiffness. So now we're we're trying to we're starting to explore: can we actually make this part out of sheet metal material? You know, you can fold a lot of shapes out of paper that you could never do in stain or in any kind of stain uh, steel. Right, because in steel you've got to use you know breaks and shears and all the different things, and you've got real you can't just bend a piece of paper to get your hand in for the moment and then bend it back. You can't do that with a piece of steel. So um, by scaling all this up, you start to learn. And um, so this then was the next step. And we also encountered uh, the next big challenge was oh gosh when you when you bend a piece of paper. Uh, you get a sharp crease, right? A beautiful sharp crease. Well, you don't get that in metal. You can't do that. Metal just doesn't bend that way because of its stiffness. So I had to start somehow simulating the actual bend radius of the steel. And so there is there is a uh, a beautiful. Um, uh, it's called uh, bend allowance, and bend allowance is this. Uh, theory of how metal bends, and so there's a lot. There's been a lot of research done on on uh, bend analysis, and and so um, I basically wrote in the algorithm uh, so that the geometry that you need for a piece of paper to take on this shape is a different geometry than if you bend this thing out of metal, because you can see in this diagram that the metal has a natural tendency to maintain some larger radius. That radius is, is controlled by the angle of the bend, the thickness of the material, and the type of material it is, and um, as, as well as the machinery that you're using, you know, the die sizes, die and punch size that you're using. So you've got to take in all of those into account and so because each of these parts is unique, every one of the, it wasn't like I could just do the seven parts that make up one module and just say, oh, it's those angles every time, because it's not. The way the geometry is on this structure is, you know, the, the modules change size. Well, those all those angles change size too, because the walls thickening and tapering and all these things. So each one of these angles is unique. So every single one of these parts had unique bends too. So that was all worked into the into the uh, algorithm as well. So it would actually generate and calculate what that bend radius was, represented in the in the uh, file, and then generating the uh, laser cut file. So my algorithm generated all the laser cut geometry. So basically, I took the files and handed them the geometry, and all they had to do is basically unfold it and cut it because it was already all these uh, bin deductions were already taken into account. Um, so anyway, quite a extensive algorithm, um, but it's, it's really reacting to the realities of fabrication. Um, and that's where my fabrication uh, background kind of, this was the final prototype, which was in fact full scale and full material. Um, and, and the actual material, this was stainless steel. And 
luckily on this one, we said, well, we'll build this prototype. And if it doesn't work, we'll make an adjustment, and build it one more time. Or if we get lucky and this last one works, uh, or this one works, then we'll be able to just use it as the first part of the wall, which is what we had done. It just turned out that we had, in fact, solved all the problems adequately, and uh, it went together beautifully. It took uh, these 1,500 parts, 30, 42,000 volts, whatever it is, um, took three guys six weeks to assemble, um, which is pretty amazing. $800,000 wall. Uh, three guys, six weeks, which is kind of almost no time at all because parts were going together just fine. They never had any problem that shut them down. They just kind of just kept going, started. I bet they were sick of doing bolts by then, but um, glad they did it and not me. So these are um, these are just some hero shots of that. I just wanted to kind of show you guys how those how this performative uh, process of works structurally. It works from a fabrication perspective. Uh, and then we'll just kind of enjoy images from this Doris Miller Memorial. Um, some close details to show you the precision of the fabrication. And super close. All, my algorithm had all these radii for all the corners are all adjusted appropriately. They're all the little notching you see, the notching here that, you know, because you can't bend it clear to the geometry there, you had to cut that back. So it kind of doesn't all get all, you know, conflicted there at where all these plates are coming together. You know, there's how many plates? One, two, three, four, five, six, and there's one underneath seven. All seven plates are coming together at that single point. So there's quite a potential for, and then all the bolt holes that have to align to do that. This is uh, more just details. Sorry, I'm kind of going through these. Gives you a sense of scale. You can see this, how tall the 17 feet is way up here. And this is, this is uh, just some people obviously, and uh, give you a sense of scale. And 42 meters long, which is about 140 feet, 17 feet tall, 2.7 millimeters, which is a tenth of an inch, a little bit less than an eighth of an inch thick. Sorry, I, the bolt holes. Uh, that is, sorry, the, yeah, it's 18,000 bolt holes, sorry. I think I misspoke there, sorry. Anyway, those are the, these are the right numbers. Um, okay, and I just wanted to show you kind of, I've, I think I've got just another minute or two, um, but this is my work going forward. Um, I spent the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, I was no longer in the PhD program <laughs> because I couldn't get to China. And um, so I, um, I started writing an algorithm to generate very complex geometry again. And so this is what I call a weaving method. And so these are, um, this bowl is made of uh, veneer, veneer wood. And then these are stainless steel, stainless steel sculptures and this little dish. But uh, they are all driven by, uh, there are two layers and each layer is unique. And uh, those are joined together and create basically any, any shape you can describe, you can generate that form out of this, this algorithm I wrote. And so this algorithm basically generates all the proper parts, unrolls them. And so then you just basically take them back, bend them up and, and, and uh, join them together. And so you can just kind of see these guys. This is a larger piece that I'm uh, hopefully scheduled to do in Moore, Oklahoma. Um, you can see the scale there. It's 14 feet tall. Um, it's using this same method. So this is this is basically a flower bud, um, and it's got an internal little tiny little room. You know, very you can kind of two people can stand up in there, maybe sneak a kiss or something. And then um, uh, these overlapping petals, and that's kind of what's out in front of me. And that's it. Okay, um, that's really kind of all I had, but I, I hope you guys um, 
got a glimpse of kind of what top down versus bottom up is, and then also the value and the power behind computational methods of design where you've kind of reversed the process, where you develop a, uh, like on the Doris Miller Memorial, I started with a general, a general overall idea of a ship shape, but I didn't really know what the real geometry was until I was able to study the structural implications and the, the, the fabrication connections and all those things. And then those kind of backed into the actual final ship shape that I, I went with. So there's an interesting kind of reversal. Instead of starting with a shape and then figuring out what we have to do to get there, you start with the relationships of all the different plates and pieces and parts, and then you back into what that geometry is, and then you can manipulate that because once you have those relationships established, there are many solutions. And so then you get to be more subjective. So it's kind of, it feels a little bit like a bottom up, top down uh, hybrid version because the pragmatics are handled in the bottom up and they you, you always still kind of have some latitude in the top down version. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, my uh, website is beyondmetal.com if you want to check out any of my other work. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay. See you later. Thanks. Bye.